Hello, and welcome to Making Sense of It. I'm Mona Duncan, your moderator, and our speaker today is the professor, uh, Robert Martin, and uh, he is looking at different chapters in his upcoming book, and I'm really impressed with this one. I like it, and I look forward to what he's going to share with us, because the topic is the courage to be imperfect. So welcome, Robert. How are you doing today? Thank you. Oh, very good. Very good. Yes. Very We're good. enjoying uh, some melting of snow here in uh, the eastern mm -hmm. part of what I refer to as southern Iowa, because uh, people don't know where northeast Missouri is. So I just say, think of southern Iowa over 20 miles from the border. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the all the... And and the coldest spot in North and the coldest spot in Missouri almost always. Uh -huh. hmm. okay. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Well, we're ready for you to share with us about the courage to be imperfect. Okay. Well, uh, let me bring this up. And. Uh, Okay, is that showing? Yes, you got it. Okay, so this is about the courage to be imperfect. And uh, I always have, to, I'm really enthusiastic about this one because it's something that I have heard a number of times in 1968 from Rudolf Dreikers, and I've remembered it ever since. And I think it's certainly one of the best pieces of, of advice that I've ever heard. So, uh, the problem with good ideas is that you have to do them. And uh, I've, I haven't found where this is from, but I know that uh, Bill Glasser liked to say this. And it was like, it's one of the things that I remember him saying in his presentations. The problem with a good idea is you have to do it. Uh, But the problem is, is that we want to feel motivated, comfortable, prepared, and perfect before acting. And that's not the way things work. So here's some uh, good advice, which most people will not take, uh, but I'll present it anyway. The first thing is uh, something that I uh, was traveling up to Chicago uh, in my micro bus around uh, 19... 75 or so uh, with uh, a colleague of mine named Bruce here. And I was talking about working on a book and I was saying, well, I'm just not ready. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite ready to do this. And he said, if you wait till you're ready, you'll never do anything. And I have remembered that ever since. I think that was a wonderful piece of advice. So another piece of advice, which I like is the biggest risk is not taking any. And I'm not sure who ever said that. I'm thinking it was anonymous. And the point is, is that few risks are dangerous, illegal or immoral. Uh, so what are we afraid of? Usually, well, I'm gonna be embarrassed or I might fail. And you know, it's like, <laughs> if you are embarrassed enough times, uh, you, won't, you won't feel embarrassed. And I love this story that my, cousin told about when she was in her education classes, the professor had them all get down on their hand, hands and knees and do a dog race for from uh, one uh, end of the classroom to the other, and then had them go back to their seats. And he said, okay, well now you don't have to worry about uh, being embarrassed to, to your class because you've already done something that's totally silly. You'll never have to do anything this silly again. So, uh, I like this car, this old Buick here, or is it a Chevrolet? I'm not sure. So I, I saw this documentary on Tom Wolfe, who you may not know of, but it was a very fair, famous writer in his day. Uh, and uh, he started out, he persuaded somebody at a major... Uh, magazine to send him out to California to study the used car 
groups that were out there. And so he stayed out there for two months, collected all kinds of notes, came back and told his editor, I'm really sorry, you're going to have to cancel the piece. I just can't do it. And he said, no, we're not going to, we'll find somebody else to write it. You go write up your notes, give me your notes, I'll get somebody to write it. So he went home, he basically stayed up all night, wrote and wrote and wrote, came in in the morning, and it was run as the piece. And uh, he became famous as Tom Wolf, who, by the way, wrote, among other things he wrote, was uh, The Right Stuff that became The Right Stuff movie. So here's Maya Angelou, who I had the good fortune to see and listen to. I don't know that she gave this quote, but I really like the quote. Courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. You can practice any virtue erratically, but nothing consistently without courage. And she was somebody who in her writing showed enormous courage. So she really knew what she was talking about. So the problem with all this good advice, which I have mostly taken, uh, it doesn't work for most people, even me. I have to keep reading new things that say the same thing. And why is this? Uh, we find that uh, for the most part, good advice, people don't take it. Why is that? And I think it's because we don't know ourselves well enough, or the people we're trying to help don't know themselves well enough. We don't reflect on our experience and how we might change it. We don't really know who we are, and so we're not able to follow up on it. So recently, I've run into this strange phenomena with some of my uh, relatives uh, in my extended family that people don't want to know what they want because then they might be disappointed if they don't get it. So they're very resistant about thinking about what do I want? What do I really want? Uh, because then they won't be disappointed. And the problem is, is that even if we are disappointed, we're going to learn something. Failure can be a success when we learn what we should have, could have, would have done. Uh, and, you know, that's even they say when you do your thesis, and we all find this out, by the time you get to, to the end of it, you realize how you could have, should have, uh, would have done it differently. So, but then you can go on and uh, do something else and it'll be better. When we avoid getting to know what we want, then we avoid the risk of uh, going for what we want. And that's a key idea in choice theory. Choice theory is never going to work for you if you don't think about and try out and figure out what is it that I want. We may just avoid doing things instead of learning about what we should have done or could have done differently. So choice theory can only work if we know what we want. We're willing to take responsibility for going after what we want. And this is something that people are very, very resistant to because a lot of things we don't even know that it was our choice. When we're anxious or depressed, it's not that something causes us to be anxious or depressed. It's that it, our interpretation. We don't do that consciously or willingly and intentionally, but until we take responsibility for the fact that that's how I'm interpreting it, that's how I'm seeing it, then we can't put choice theory into use. And then the final thing is we need to be able to make a plan and carry it, carry it out. And uh, this is why I think a counselor who's trained in this method can be so useful because it can help people stop avoiding taking responsibilities, figuring out what they want and making a plan. So this is the strategy. Maybe we need to get to know ourselves better. And that's what a good counselor does. 
here are a bunch of additional strategies that can work with ourselves and others. And uh, I would say nobody should use all of these at any one time. You should pick one that resonates with you and then just do that one. So I'm gonna present these very quickly. So the first one and the big one that we can't avoid and that is just act. And here's a wonderful quote I really like. Begin to act the part as well as you can of the person you would rather be, the person you most want to become. Gradually, the old fearful person will fade away. Uh, William Glasser. Another one I really like is from Tom Peters, who was a uh, famous guru for Fortune 500 days in his day. And he said, ready, fire, aim. In other words, uh, you got to start firing. And this is how we learn as, as kids. You know, you want somebody to, as a, as a one-year-old or whatever, you put a piece of paper in front of them, a paintbrush, some paint or some crayons, and you let them start scribbling. It's how we all learn. Something I like, my version, another version I like really better is fire ready aim, which is the same as do something and you'll figure out what you need to do by doing it. It's the only way. So, and if you're resisting, then figure out, and I've said this before in a previous presentation, do the smallest thing you can think of rather than nothing. And then at least, even if you do the wrong thing, you'll learn what not to do. Another thing which comes from Carol Dweck is the idea, focus on effort, not talent. If people have told you all your life, you're gifted and talented and genius, throw that out the window because that makes uh, all of her research has shown with adults and with kids, especially with kids, it makes them less willing to take risks. And I did some presentation, I did some uh, work with some kids who were gifted and talented. And, and that was one of the things the teacher said is like, oh, it's so hard getting them to take risks. And it's because they were told they were gifted and talented. What we should do is focus on the effort. Gee, you, you're really making a good effort here. Focus on the effort, not the talent, because that makes us less willing to take risks. And then find ways to enjoy what you choose to do. Because if we can like something, we'll tend to get better at it. Or if we're already good at it, we'll tend to like it. So liking and getting good at something go together. It doesn't matter which one you start with. It's like a circle that you are, uh, that you get into a cycle. I love this picture. Somebody, yeah, uh, riding out on the mountain. So learning requires new behavior. And this is something that Glasser used to talk about, like to talk about. It's like, yeah, when people get in a, in a difficult situation and they're really up against it, they invent new behavior. And that's what we need to do. We need to be willing. I don't know what to do. Well, experiment, do something, anything. So I went to this conference and it was a presentation by a poet who was, had a lot of stuff poet. And he said, well, why do I write? Why do I write poetry? And he said, well, the reason is because I don't know how to write poetry. And what he meant by that is when I sit down to write a new poem, I don't know how, to, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how to do it. I have to just start doing it and experiment and, and just punch it down and let it puff up. And, and like, like making a loaf of bread, you keep punching it down and and letting it rise and then redoing it until until you figure out what you're going to do because every new poem is a new project and it's like you don't know 
exactly what it's going to be like. Another thing which I really like that people are very resistant is develop a routine. Well, I don't like routines. I want to be creative. It's like, yeah, but if you want to be creative, then the whole thing is you need to develop a routine. So Philip Glass, who's, you may like his music, you may not like his music, uh, you may never have heard of him, but he's the uh, probably the most successful contemporary uh, modern composer, uh, not non-pop kind of composer. And what he said is, I don't know that I was any more talented than anybody else, but I have a routine. I really work at it. I've just, I spend more time doing it. So a routine increases our productivity and we feel less stressed at trying to be inspired. So if you work every day, then uh, you get inspired more on a regular basis. And even if you're not inspired, you keep working until you are. And then when you're done for the day, that also makes it easier to relax and do other things and have a good time. Another key thing is that I had to learn was, because I like to say, well, gee, I'm never going to be as good as such and such. Whether it was in school or whether it was writing a book or whatever it was, there always there's so many people who are so much more successful than I am. And when you compare yourself with others, it's like the kiss of death. If you have to compare yourself, compare yourself with yourself with what you did yesterday. So now we come back to this key thing is take responsibility for your choices, which is this key idea. And admit to yourself, even if I didn't intend to make that choice, it was me. It was me. I was the one who did it. I didn't intend to do it, but I chose to do it, even if it wasn't a conscious intentional choice. We have to stop taking credit only for the things that we meant to do. Not to say, well, I didn't mean to say that. Yeah, but I did say it. <laughs> Sorry, I screwed up. Another thing is asking, well, what am I avoiding? I find this in my own self is like, things will start to pile up. I've got something right now that I've been av avoiding for the last uh, six, eight, nine months. So we procrastinate out of fear we won't be able to do something. I like Eleanor Roosevelt's saying, do one thing that scares you every day. And if you do that, pretty soon, nothing scares you. So, uh, and we're coming to the end here. Another thing is consider the worst possible consequence. If I do this thing, what's the worst possible thing that could happen? Uh, now, if you if it's skateboarding, yeah, you could break a bunch of bones and so on, but I'm not going to skateboard. And uh, most everything I do is not going to land me in jail or in hospital or in trouble with the law or uh, in trouble with uh, my friends. And then finally, I like something from one of my teachers, Herbert Brun, who was a composer. And as a composer, you have to sit down and go over uh, and figure out where maybe you make a, made a mistake in copying out a part or whatever. And he said he would keep a little glass of wine next to him and uh, take a sip whenever he found a mistake. So the idea is celebrate finding mistakes. And then finally, finish. I don't like to finish because then it's like, well, I don't have a chance anymore to improve it. It's just going to be there and it's never going to be perfect. So if you finish the project, then you can move on and do something else. So, so finally, a summary. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you notice the why is, uh, and I did that on purpose just to show, yeah, we, we, we always do things like this and we don't notice them. Uh, my wife noticed a lot of mistakes and we corrected them, but I put this one in on purpose. Oh, all these wonderful... Uh, 
photos I have are mostly from Unsplash, which I recommend to you. Uh, they're free to use. So summary, prepare not, this is something that I always tell people because I do a lot of performing of uh, singing uh, in musicals and, and so on. And uh, I'm hoping to be in the Music Man. Uh, I have to do a tryout in a week. And uh, it involves two hours of uh, singing and performing. You never get through it being perfect. What I always tell people, I practice not so much so that I'll be perfect because it's never going to be perfect. There's always some little thing, but so that I can recover from my mistakes. So I think practice is uh, a wonderful thing. Once you realize it's not all over once you make a mistake, it's just beginning. That's the purpose of practice. So trying to be perfect gets in the way of taking action. Okay, thank you very much. Well, all right, very good. Uh, yeah, yeah, we go click it down so we can just talk with you. I was taking notes while you were talking, and it looks that uh, the courage to be imperfect, it's realizing that uh, we can overdo. If you wait until you're ready, you'll never do anything. So if you're thinking about it, get in there. And that from what I'm just jogged down here, is that you are asking us to act the part, play the part that we're wanting to do, then to figure out what we're going to do by actually doing it. And then it's ideas and effort, not talent, and that we are to need the bread and more than anything else, again and again and again, I heard you say in your own special way, be yourself. Be true to yourself. Yeah, and I think one of the really important things for me about uh, Bill Glasser was that he was not perfect, but he kept doing things until he learned how to do them. I mean, and he would say, and I heard him say this many times, well, I told people to do class meetings and they said, well, we don't know, come and show us how. And he said, I went in and I couldn't do it either. And uh, then I figured out, well, I need to put people in a circle. And I did it over and over and I learned how to do it. And I, in other words, he was very good at this. But the point is, is he didn't start out good and he was willing to take the, he said, well, you know, he was already famous when he started doing this. And that's the thing is, it's very easy to say, well, I, I can't ruin my reputation. No, he was not like that. And that's what I most respect him for, was that he really lived this. So, and I constantly have to remind myself to live it by, I'm constantly reading books about exactly this kind of idea because... It keeps reminding me. It's like reading the Bible. It's You don't read it because you don't know what's in it. You read it be, to remind you, oh, yeah, yeah, I need to remember that, yeah, or whatever book that you that you like to reread, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very, very much for your uh, input. It's been wonderful, and we will close the recording down, and people can go back and watch it again. And those that are here live will have a couple of questions for you. So thanks Wonderful. a lot. Thank you and, very uh, much. Thank you, Mona.